We're talking today with John Lund of Cadillac, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, John, can you start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Cadillac, Michigan back in 1950. I was went to the school systems in Cadillac, and back then there was the draft going on, and I volunteered or enlisted at that time, back in 1969. Okay. And uh, when you were a kid, what did your family do for a living? My father was in the rubber business, B.F. Goodrich's and Cadillac. That went and moved to Ohio. Mm -hmm. We loaded up and we were going down to Ohio. We got in a car accident, so we moved back here, basically. Been here ever since. But my father was in the supplier business for automotive. And so, I, frankly, I, after 42 years myself, I was in the supplier for automotive. All right. Uh, okay. So basically, you, you go through high school, so you were not going to go to college at that point? Or not at that no? time, no. Uh, number one, we probably couldn't afford it. My brother, myself, my sister, it was my parents. Uh, and back then, there was the GI Bill, and I'm sure there's things better today than the GI Bill, actually, or the same thing. But we looked at that as an opportunity to first go into the military and serve. My dad was in World War II, uh, aerial uh, B-17 bombers. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uncle's P-51 Mustang, so I mean my other uncle was in Marines, so we grew up in the military, basically background, and we always thought and appreciated being in America, because mm -hmm. our grandparents came from offshore, basically Sweden. Right. Now, at the time you en enlisted, uh, how much did you know about Vietnam or what was happening over there? Not very much at all. Very little. The news uh, in the States, not that much. Uh, back at the age of 19, you saw all these posters, uh, whether it was the Navy or Army or Marines, about travel and excitement and being 19. I thought, boy, that sounds pretty darn good to me, you know, instead of being in Cadillac right after high school and a little bit of travel and so I went and listened. Okay. The Cadillac wouldn't have been much of a hotbed for the anti-war movement probably either. No, it wasn't. Yeah. No. no the bus, uh, for physicals, leaving Cadillac, the buses were always full. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, so when did you actually uh, head off for training? Uh, July of 1969. Uh, went through basic training and then I went down to Fort Polk, okay. Louisiana. Okay. Back up for a couple more pieces mm -hmm. here. Um, did you? When did you have your first physical? Uh, that was before. Actually, I was in this uh, school yet, mm -hmm. I, and I signed up basically before I got out of school. Okay. And it seemed like it was. Uh, April, May, somewhere around there, uh, we loaded up a bus, went down to Detroit, the old uh, VA in Detroit, which is no longer there for physicals, and then July, active went in. Okay. And when you did the physicals, um, did you notice anybody who was trying to beat the system? Oh, or get gosh. Out of it? Yes, a lot. What, what kind of things would they do? Everything from uh, not being able to hold bladder, uh, sick, uh, fainting, uh, all kinds of things, screaming, you know, it was uh, along the line because it was the draft plus you had other people that were volunteering too. So. All right, and then when people did this kind of stuff, did you notice w what happened to them or did the guys running this kind of understand what was going on? I think most of the people by that time already running it knew what was going on. And, uh, I don't know if they ever were committed to being in the military after that or not. I just didn't pay that much attention okay. to it. Okay. But, and you got to go back home then and you don't I came right away. Nope. I came back home, uh, worked a little bit, and uh, in July I went in. Okay. All right. And where did you do your basic training? Uh, Fort Knox. All right. Uh, and how did you get down there? Bus. Okay. Yep. And what sort of reception do you get when you arrive? At Fort Knox, the... I remember having a, a bag, a uh, drill sergeant, looked like he was 10 feet tall, yeah, scared the bejeebies out of me, and we were introduced, they were introduced, and off we went in to start our basic training. Okay. And what kind of processing did you get when you got there? Uh, the normal physical again, went through a lot of shots, uh, a lot of physical activity, you know, early morning activities, mm -hmm. uh, marching, mandatory. We had low crawls, uh, going through the bars before breakfast, and if you couldn't do that, you went back in line again. You know, just the normal stuff to make sure that you were physically fit in basic training. Mm -hmm. And what did they do to kind of take you out of being a civilian? 
when you first show up there, what happens to you? Well, uh, basically, they started off from scratch again, mentally and physically. Yeah, they build you back up again, the way they want you to be built. And if you don't make it, well, you're not going to probably be in the military. All right. Uh, now, how did they instill discipline? Uh, discipline was done multiple psychologically and also some physical. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was probably a little bit more physical than it is today. I mean, uh, I remember you would low crawl on, on concrete and cement and get your, your chest would get bloody at times if you really were, you know, some, doing some things bad. Force marches, night or day, you know, just the uh, basic training of the military. Okay. And how well did, or quickly did you adjust to that? I grew up hunting and fishing as a child. Mm -hmm. Probably adapted much more than some of the others that... The larger cities, when, especially the draft, and they didn't have the way to get out of it. So a lot of people had money that the kids were put into different colleges, of course, mm -hmm. to get out of the draft. I've known a few that went to three different colleges to stay out of the draft. But uh, the kids that were the inner cities had a rougher time at times. Mm -hmm. There probably would have been, you know, to be in the situation of man carry, low crawls. It was, it was pretty rough for some of them. And then being away from the parents. Okay. And were there others who just had trouble with the discipline and following orders? Oh, yes. Well, you, because some of them were being drafted. Some of them probably had uh, somewhat records behind them mm -hmm. that were minor, of course, and volunteered one way or another for the draft, one will say. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Uh, and then how long did basic training take? Basic was roughly uh, 10 weeks, 8 to 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. Then we had about a week off, and then we were transported into different locations for advanced training. Okay. Uh, now, at what point did you know what your specialization was going to be? Did they well, tell you at Fort Knox? or Fort Polk. Okay. So when you got to Fort Polk. Yes. All right. And how did you get down to Fort Polk? Bus again. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just bust a bunch of you straight from Fort Knox to Fort I Polk? I grabbed a bus out of Cadillac after a week off. Okay. And off I went. Say goodbye to my parents, brother, sister, and off we went. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to get from Cadillac to Fort Polk, Louisiana on a bus? We had an overnight stay, and the accommodations weren't the best, but, I mean, a roof over your head, half a bed. You got something. You got something. That wasn't bad. Okay. And food. All right. Uh, and now where in Louisiana is Fort Polk? It's right along, probably southwest, towards the southwest corner of Louisiana, almost. Almost at the river. Mm -hmm. A lot of swamp, a lot of low ground, a lot of good training area. All right. And what did the training program there consist of? More advanced training, weaponry, more weaponry training, and then we had jungle school per se down there, uh, going through hamlets, doing uh, counterinsurgency uh, training, uh, captured, what to say, what not to say, uh, through, uh, set up like a, a Vooch type system in Vietnam. So, you know, when you start going through that, and then some of the language we're looking at, trying to learn some of the Vietnamese words, you kind of knew where you were going mm -hmm. at that point in time. Okay. And the people training you, uh, how many of them do you think had been to Vietnam? That I really don't know. Uh, maybe a third, some around there. I mean, did anybody talk about what it was actually like to be in Vietnam, or were you just getting more generic training? A uh, few of them did. Uh, but most of us, most of us seem to be more generic. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, as you're going through training, is there anybody who's trying to explain to you why you were in Vietnam in the first place, or is that not really? Not really. No. Okay. We had a mission to do, and that was it. All right. Now, how long did the advanced training take? It was about another ten weeks, eight to ten weeks at Fort Polk. Okay. And then what happens to you after you finish that? I came home for, I believe, about two weeks. And then after that, off I went. Another bus ride, and an aircraft, and yeah, uh, Alaska, Japan, and then over to Vietnam. Now, where did you fly out of from the U.S.? I flew out of, uh, uh, first out of Detroit, and it seemed to me it was like Chicago, and then in nonstop to Alaska, and then Alaska to Japan, and then Japan over to uh, South Vietnam. Okay. And it can't, we flew into Cameron Bay. All right. Uh, and did you come in during a day or a night? Uh, I was fortunate to come into the day in Cameron Bay. It was quite a shock. It was a big Air Force base, though. I mean, it was massive. All right. I kind of thought everybody lived like that. No, it wasn't quite the case. No. Uh, now, what was your first impression of Vietnam when you got there? Hot and humid. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do they do with you when you get off the plane? I, I uh, got off the plane. We were taken over. We had to get cleaned up. I remember taking a shower in a big room for a shower. And the next thing I hear, a lady's voice is coming into the shower. And there wasn't anything discreet at all. So you had to get used to it. If you weren't used to it, you better get used to it very fast. Because everybody got cleaned up, washed up, and including the people that were working on the base there it happened to be men and ladies uh, Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And so, here we go. We got cleaned up and uh, we went through some uh, debriefings at that point in time and then different people went to different locations out of Cameron Bay. Okay. How long do you think you spent at Cameron Bay? Oh, I don't think I was there for more than maybe two days, two or three days. Okay. It seemed very short. All right. And so you're just waiting for your name to get called and get an assignment? Or? Yeah. Uh, called and head to the next location. Okay. Now, did you have, when you came over, did you have orders or were you... I had orders. Uh, they weren't ex explicit other than that I would be heading north. Okay. Yeah. But it didn't identify what unit you'd be joining or Not anything for else certain, like no. that? No. Okay. Uh, so you, you go north. Um, by what process or where do you go? So you leave Cameron Bay? Aircraft, C-130s. Okay. And where do you land? Uh, our first was uh, Da Nang, if I remember mm -hmm. right. And then from there we were trucked. Okay. To a place called Camp Sally. All right. And where was Camp Sally relative to, say, the DMZ? Or... It was, uh, I'm not certain kilometers wise, but it was in the northern part of South Vietnam, mm -hmm. right off the uh, 101. It was a tent uh, base. Okay. So, I mean, off of Highway 1? Hi Highway 1, okay. yes. Was it close to Camp Evans or Fubai or any it of those? It was uh, close to Camp Evans. And it was, I think it was north of Fubai, because Fubai ended up being my last base. Mm -hmm. So I kind of okay. went the other way around. Yeah. And so when you get up to Camp Sally, now what happens? I got assigned. Okay. And what unit were you assigned to? Assigned to recon. You explain that for a civilian audience. Uh, reconnaissance, long range patrol, basically mm -hmm. uh, teams. We had four teams. Okay. And uh, the second part was that? What unit were you actually in? What battalion? Uh, second 501st. Okay, 2nd Battalion, 501st Regiment. And, and they were assigned as a recon team. Right. To, to and then them. what division were they in? 2nd, uh, basically. It would be the 2nd 501st. Well, you're in the 100, 101st Airborne. Airborne, but we're assigned to the 2nd 501st. Right. Which would be there. Right. Yep. Yep. And then we I'm, were, just, I'm just giving oh, you the military nomenclature. Yeah. And so and you have battalions, we regiments, yeah, divisions. We were tied from there, basically, to work in a reconnaissance team supporting whatever that needs, needs to be at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So it might not necessarily be the actual battalion you're in. You might support somebody else, or were you usually supporting 501st? Uh, not we supported the 501st, 506th, uh, anyone in that in that certain area that we worked, okay. in, towards the, uh, the ocean border area mainly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're assigned to the unit, and now, and then you go into, a, you, you join a particular team. team. Yes. Okay, and then when, when you, did you meet them on the base? Or I, I the met field? them on a fire base. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman's name that I first remember was Johnny. He was a ranger, and he was a sergeant. Very nice gentleman, uh, down to earth. Uh, yeah, it was quite interesting. I mean, there were some people there that were higher officially up than us, and Mr. Hughes didn't say anything polite about them at all. And he grabbed me by the collar and he says, follow me. And that was uh, my introduction. Off I went. All right. Uh, and how did they, did anybody, then did he try to actually sort of teach you what you yes. had to know? Yes. Okay. So talk a little bit about, the, you know, what, are, what recon missions were, were like, what we were doing out there. Uh, we were on basically call 24-7. And if a line company was down or ambushed, uh, needed help, they'd pull our team in. Maybe one team or two teams, or maybe even all four teams would have to go in. We'd usually go at night, but most of our activity we worked at night. Back then we didn't have, you know, the gear they have today. Uh, we traveled at night, mostly by river, that we didn't leave our, you know, sign around. Mm -hmm. And we're very uh, discreet about it, but in a team there were generally six of us. We had a medic, mm -hmm. sometimes we had a sniper, and we had uh, resources. We uh, were. I guess what I enjoyed was the food. We had alerts. We did not have canned food. Mm -hmm. You could carry a lot more food. <laughs> right. So the alerts are the dried? It's dried. It's yes. dried, yeah. yeah. 
the kind of ancestors yeah, of the modern yeah. stuff. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you don't, might be on a mission for only a half a day. You could be out there for two weeks. Depends on what the mission is. Do you remember the first mission you went on? Uh, yes, I do. Well, that was the first actual mission uh, I went on was on a mountainside, and I, I mentioned listening to Christmas time, listening to Christmas carols on a 25 radio way mm -hmm. up on top of a mountain up in the Ashaw. A lot of jungle, a lot of heat, and uh, it was a fast, a fast learning curve. Okay, so you're getting out there in sort of December of '69. Mm -hmm. um, earlier that year, there had been some very heavy fighting in the Ashaw Valley at Hamburger Hill and things yes. like that. Some months earlier, mm -hmm. uh, how much activity was there in December? Uh, December, we did not have that much. We started getting uh, quite a lot of activity January through March. Uh, we were very fortunate. We did a lot of missions. Uh, we lost one of our team members in March, if I remember right. And then uh, we were working in the in the same area, uh, basically always jungle. Sometimes you get into an area that was a picturesque valley in the jungle. Mm -hmm. A lot of rivers, way up in the mountains of rivers. Uh, there were a lot of critters. I mean, I did get to see black panther. A lot of different snakes, uh, land leeches, uh, you know, the normal activity in jungles, different types of spider, spiders, monkeys, uh, some types of apes. Uh, I'm not certain what type they were. We didn't really, you didn't shoot anything mm -hmm. because it, there's no sense of giving away your positions to person, right. personally. Okay. Now, when you were conducting sort of a planned patrol mm -hmm. as opposed to an emergency mission of some yeah. kind. How did you go about doing that? Was yeah, it a normal we, routine? There was a normal routine. We'd go in, basically we'd try to go in at night, try to be as quiet as possible, and then as soon as we were put down, you know, for a, we may be put into an area because uh, aerial reconnaissance picked up maybe ground activity, antennas, uh, lines going through treetops in the jungles, things like that. So we were put in to do some reconnaissance work in those areas to try to find out how much activity was there, what units were there, and then try to get out. Mm -hmm. Okay, now when you went in, you're going in at night, uh, now did you have an LZ to land in, or did no. you go down on lines? We'd go on lines, we'd generally repel. If we were fortunate to not have to repel, then it'd be in high grass, but then mm -hmm. that wasn't very good either, because you never knew how high the grass really was. And sometimes with a rucksack and weapons, uh, it was further down than you anticipated. So mm -hmm. at least on uh, repelling, you knew when to break. Mm -hmm. to slow yourself down at least. Yeah. All right. And, and because you're doing that at night, I, now, could you see anything when you're doing that? No. No. Nope. Uh, same if, uh, if you had to extract somebody, they use, sometimes we use penetrators, uh, which was a, a post with a seat, somebody mm -hmm. got wounded there, you still go right. through the jungle, triple, triple canopy jungle up through the trees. So it was uh, kind of interesting at times. All right. Uh, and now, once you, you land someplace, um, I mean, did you, were there situations where, you know, enemy were waiting for you, or did you manage to get the jump on them? Sometimes uh, they were waiting for us, other times no. If we got into an area that we would say that we put in maybe two or three clicks away from mm -hmm. that area, then we'd move in at night, mainly travel at night, and lay low in the daytime, and try to see what movements in the area, and uh, see what information we could gather at that mm -hmm. point in time. And what kind of weapons did you have with you? We were fortunate. Uh, we had a gentleman back at the base. He was our weapons specialist. We had uh, M16s, which uh, long base, CAR-15, short base. We could use shotguns. We had Remingtons. We had uh, sniper weapons. Uh, so, you know, we were outfitted back in those days better than some. Mm -hmm. Not like it is today. Yeah. Would people carry more than one weapon? Or usually just take, take a weapon of choice? A weapon of choice and a lot of ammo that you could carry. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, try, you try to travel light in a recon team of yeah. six people. You wanted to be able to, as I used to say, beat feet fast. Because you might get in activities that were well outnumbering yourself and you mm -hmm. didn't have much of a choice besides run. And when you're in the jungle, would you use trails or make your own trails? Try, try to make our own, but never cut our own way. Never cut a trail. So you just kind of push your way through things? Push your way, but if you work the restraints, mm -hmm. uh, that you never left a trail. Okay. Now, would the North Vietnamese have ambushes on the streams, or did you not encounter any? Not so much there, but on their trails they did. I mm -hmm. mean, in the Ashaw, they had mountainside steps. They had hospitals undergrounds that we came into. I mean, they were, they were a pretty, pretty uh, adverse bunch to fight.
Mm -hmm. They were well trained. Uh, there were people in South Vietnam that had been there for 10 years fighting not just us, but I think even the French. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we had people that they had information on them. We had Kit Carson scouts with us, and they uh, would interpret the information. And some of these guys were there, and they were lucky to see their wives, their families in North Vietnam for maybe a year or two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would be in a bunker complex and very dedicated very strong-willed people. All right. Now, in the course of conducting these patrols, what kinds of things were you finding? We were finding anything from uh, underground bunker complexes, weaponry, hospitals underground, small. Uh, if they were like in line companies area, if they contact line companies, they would move out, they'd hit, they'd move out, they'd hit again and move out but they would have wounded people, and a lot of times, way up in the ash hall, they'd have areas that were the size of this kitchen underground, and there would be uh, flesh, fresh blood, there would be towels, bandages, things like that, if we were in pursuit of them. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever walk into any of these things that were still occupied? Yes. And that was not good in a six-man team. Mm -hmm. yep. And did you do that intentionally or by accident? Both. Uh, accident, ambush. Intentionally, we had missions that we were uh, given to go after them mm -hmm. and try to get as much information uh, at the time. Okay. Now, there, kind of January, February, March, what was the weather like at that point? Uh, I never knew it when it was really cold over there. Mm -hmm. Monsoons came, kind of gave us a break uh, because I thought the North Vietnamese weren't going to be doing any, any much more than we were in the monsoons. Mm -hmm. So we got a little bit of downtime in the jungle, one would say. But didn't the monsoons make it hard to use the helicopters? Oh, that was yes. Uh, I still remember the name of one group. They were called Black Widow. And to this day, I'd give my hand out to these guys. I don't care what the missions were, how bad the rains were, the monsoons, these boys would get in the chopper and either drop us off or get us out. If we had to run or get him out to a different area, They'd, they'd uh, pop smoke, blow an LZ, the boys would come in and get a check. Mm -hmm. Just dedicated us all get out. And that's what I remember today. They were, they were called Black Widow. All right. Uh, now, you're there for a few months, and then uh, you got wounded. Yes. Right. Um, kind of when did that happen? What happened? Uh, I can definitely remember that. It was uh, it was in uh, April 23rd I got wounded. Uh, a week before that, we were working not too far from Ripcord and we were picking up an awful lot of more activity of the enemy. I mean, there were uh, areas that had 51 uh, caliber tripods and they built a, a track around it or a trench and have it built up and had 50 ones put on top of it. And our job was to do recon work and then we could call in support to try to knock that stuff out. Because mm -hmm. those machine guns were effective on aircraft weapons. So they could yeah, shoot oh, yes. helicopters. Yeah. What they generally do, they'd go between two mountainsides and mm -hmm. the jet would come in, they'd just put it ahead of it and take them out. And our job was to try to take them out. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then you were, were you were conducting a mission of that sort? Yep. And, you, you, and we walked into an ambush. Yeah. Okay. Now, when that happens, um, somebody starts shooting at you. Yeah, all hell breaks loose, yeah. basically. And, and so, um, what, what's the standard reaction? What does a patrol do when you walk into an ambush? Uh, you, you're basically in a defensive mode. You try to take care of different areas, uh, different radiuses of where the fire is coming from and uh, hopefully in our case we had a line company come back in because there was so much activity in there a line company came in and uh, they were put into that area we were extra extracted out of that area but unfortunately uh, Mr. Nix he was a sergeant at the time Benjamin Nix he was killed I was wounded I was airlifted out but even getting out was just a tremendous obstacle because there wasn't an LZ there I remember mm -hmm. Uh, trying to get up on a big log, and a guy grabbed me from the back and well, on the skin, and I was trying to hold on to the skin, still trying to fire a weapon. Mm -hmm. And it was a, probably a lot of, uh, put it this way, the, the pilot, co-pilot of the helicopter were fantastic because there was a little panel on the side, and he was taking all kinds of, sh and, you know, a lot of ricochets inside mm -hmm. the, a lot of bullets, and we still made it out, and they flew me into uh, Da Nang uh, Field Hospital at that time. Shortly after that, most of my team came. Okay. Now, um, how badly were you hurt? Uh, I, I kid about it today because I, 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 I said I didn't run fast enough to get into cover. Mm -hmm. I, I took it in the right hand, uh, the neck, 
pretty much everything in the trying to get out of the way. Right. Yeah. And uh, still be able to fire. Okay. And um, how long then did you spend uh, in the hospital? Well, I spent uh, to about the th second or third week of May. They flew me out of the Nang uh, Field Hospital down to Cameron Bay Air Force Hospital down mm -hmm. there, and that was like a new world for me. I was I I was. I can't say bummed out, but my gosh, they had hooches, they had hot food, there was, and I used to, I kid it because the nurses, they were around, I had nurses, and it was like as being a civilian, and I was there for rehabilitation, and then uh, after I got better, I wanted to go back up north again. Mm -hmm. How long were you at Cameron Bay? Uh, probably around three weeks. Okay. Uh, so you basically you didn't have the million dollar wound that sends you home or anything nope. like that. But at your place, just the way you were thinking, you wanted to go back and join I the unit. I probably had a million dollar wound though because uh, our teams were flown in. We never got to a big base. Our teams were flown into a place called Henderson mm -hmm. for a couple of days of stand down, which we were up on a fire base. We'd get a drink hot beer and get drunk basically mm -hmm. and try to see if somebody wanted to shoot at us for entertainment. Right. And they were overran. We lost almost two full teams to Henderson. Uh, gentlemen, in fact, this giving the reunion this year, uh, Doc Benda is one of the few survivors of our team. And he patched up everybody he could patch up. Mm -hmm. But it was a. Uh, so when I came back uh, to recon again, I basically had involved with almost three new teams. I didn't know very many of the members at all. They're pretty much all new except for uh, some real close friends of mine, but then they were killed at Ripcord too. All right. Uh, now, talk a little bit, bit about. Um, what sort of what your experience with the Ripcord campaign? They sort of two five zero six builds a fire base up yeah. there in April, and they are up there April, May, June, and, yeah. uh, through July, uh, operating in the area and eventually under siege yeah. and chased off. Mm -hmm. um, now, what connection did your operations have to that, or what did you know about what was going on? We worked that area from probably January, uh, in different areas outside of their realm. And because we took some uh, a lot of activity, that's where I actually got wounded in that area. Mm -hmm. And then uh, must have been around the first week of July, maybe before that even, we were doing some reconnaissance work in the Ripcord area. And then we got definitely closer to the Ripcord area. Then we volunteered, uh, the militarized volunteers. Mm -hmm. yeah. We got volunteered to join up with two line companies. And that was, uh, I was there on the second. Uh, on, for a fact, on July the second in Ripcord area, because mm -hmm. we were using a, we were using snipers at that point in time, and then uh, around the ninth, a very good friend of mine was killed up at Ripcord. It was a it was a something that should not have happened. We were working with Alpha and Bravo Company, and uh, one team was out up, up on the other side of a saddle. And the line company put out line or claymores because mm -hmm. the North Vietnamese had drug trails going up and down through there. And unfortunately, we were not notified of that. And our team walked into a claymore. So you walked into so a, your lost, own ambush. Yeah. yeah. Or I lost a real close friend there. And uh, that was the 9th of July. And then it seemed like it was the 14th of July. We definitely teamed up with Alpha and Bravo because I think it was the second time that they were going to do assault on Hill 1000. Mm -hmm. See, we really didn't know, we, we had maps, and we knew, because we knew the activity was awfully heavy in the area, because mm -hmm. we've been working the area. But we really didn't have any idea how much support the NVA had until the 14th of July. Okay, and what do you remember about that day? Uh, we, it, you could hear a, working, living in the jungle, I, I felt comfortable in the jungle, you could hear birds, you heard, we used to kid about, kid about a lizard that used to sound like, I hate to, I'd be a, I kind of swear on this, they used to go, oh, fuck you. Yep. And it was, you know, kind of fun for us. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of wildlife and things. But yeah, on Ripcord, off Hill 1000, you could hear a pin drop. There wasn't nothing survivable, birds, nothing. And then I think it was the morning of the 14th, uh, there was an assault again. We, we were one of the leaves on the assault to go down a saddle and there were down timber, there was uh, still a lot of jungle, and we got down towards the bottom, and then all hell broke loose. We knew we were going to hit em enemy mm -hmm. activity, but we didn't exactly figure that much. I mean, it was uh, chaotic. Uh, you looked for cover, there were rocks, there were big trees to go behind, but no matter where you were, 
it seemed like somebody had in your sights. A lot of bunkers. Mm -hmm. The bunkers were up, uh, up higher than us because we had to go down below and they were up above us. And it seems like every time you took out a bunker, there was four or five more in that same bunker. Mm -hmm. And it was endless. And, uh, yeah, because they had tunnels deep into the hill. Yeah. So you might take out who was at the front of the bunker, but someone else comes Somebody in. Somebody else came in. And, and actually, from our standpoint, you could see a great big cave. It was, I don't know if it's north or south. It seemed to me it was uh, west of Ripcord, a little bit south. There's just a massive natural. And you could see the Viet uh, North Vietnamese coming out and going back in, coming out, you know. But it was, uh, yeah, it was very chaotic. Uh, two line companies we were involved with. Uh, pinned down for a long time. Uh, they had heavy weapons. They had RPGs. Uh, thank goodness for the cover we had overhead because they were mm -hmm. mortaring us. Mm -hmm. And they had hit the trees with the mortars and then they'd explode. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness if they came down, we would have mm -hmm. had a lot more people lost and what they were. But uh, I remember uh, after, I can't remember how long we were pinned down. It was a long time. Blind companies were taking beating, losing people. We we're trying to get people, at that point in time, we we're trying to get people back out again. Mm -hmm. I remember going up, crawling up, and there was a gentleman laying down. I don't know if his knee was out or his leg was out, but I latched onto him when I helped him get up the where we started, basically. Mm -hmm. But I, I, to this day, I have no idea how we made it. I mean, there were more. It seemed like there was bullets zinging everywhere. There were. Yeah. Did you get fire support? I mean, did there? We did have. Actually, it was uh, South Vietnamese flying World War II aircraft. And because the jets had a hard time, jets would come in, but they had a hard time getting down in that depth. Mm -hmm. And so they were using South Vietnamese at the time, and there were some fantastic World War II aircraft that were flying at that point in time. And these guys were good pilots. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you get artillery support or just the air? Uh, more air at the time because we were pretty close in. Mm -hmm. When we backed out, we got artillery support. We had uh, jet support, things like that, when we finally got back out. but. Mm -hmm. After the 14th, we, we did reconnaissance. Our teams would pull reconnaissance to see how the activity was going, but we never did another assault after the 14th, if I remember. Okay. Not a full assault. Now, while you were operating around Ripcord, I mean, could you hear the bombardment of the base yes. or any of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, with 110 cameras, it seemed like miles away, but it wasn't. You'd, you'd hear the bombardment, the weapons going off, and uh, you'd see. Uh, choppers coming in, choppers trying to leave, uh, uh, Chinooks, it was uh, pretty chaotic for the guys mm -hmm. on the base. Yeah. Right. Okay. And did you have any sense at the time of how the battle was going or anything like that? Well, back then, not really, other than uh, we didn't even know for certain. We know there were a lot more uh, NVA, hardcore NVA, there were, you know, the regulars in the area than uh, probably that we anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, outnumbered by a long shot. Okay. Uh, now, were you able to pick up in intelligence? I mean, would you, did you ever tap into any, any communication lines or capture documents or things like we that? We had some information, written documentation that we'd gotten, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing tapping into the lines. They did have some real good communications. Oh, I mean, they had little wires going through the mm -hmm. jungles. They had steps going out the jungles. I mean, these boys were well equipped. All right. Uh, now, do you remember kind of hearing about Ripcord being evacuated? Uh, yes. Uh, that was towards the end of the month. They mm -hmm. were started to, in fact, we were evacuated probably before that was. The 102nd 501st, somewhere around the 20th, somewhere mm -hmm. around there, we were pulled out completely. Yeah. And uh, then the base was evacuated after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, after that, I mean, did, did you get any kind of stand down or did you just go back out we, again? We went back to uh, Camp Evans, if I remember, and then we were bused down to uh, Fubai through Way. It was the first time I got to see Way, mm -hmm. so I got some pictures, some civilian pictures of Way going through on a bus mm -hmm. or military trucks. That was the first time I actually got to see too much on the civilian side. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, our four teams were, if we got to, when you consider stand down, we were taken off a mission, taken to a fire base, uh, maybe a night or two nights on a fire base, mm -hmm. and then we were given another mission, we go from there, and we did that for quite a long time. Right. I mean, it's... Okay. And so this time you actually see a little bit, now were they taking you someplace for some kind of R&R? &R, or oh, just, no. No, we were just get a new base. New base. We were... Uh, Tagged again to another fire base called Bastogne. 
And that was our home base for quite some time after Evans, it seemed like. Bastogne was a fire base. All right. And where was Bastogne? It was uh, towards Way, uh, not too far from Way. But it, was, it was a roadable, drivable. We okay. had a road to it, which is uncommon for us. Most of the fire bases around didn't have roads. You had one way in, one way out. All right. Now, was it kind of up in, in the hills that separate the coast from the coast. Asheville It was up in the hills, but it wasn't up in the Asheville itself. Okay. You could see the Asheville and the mountains in the background, but uh, the NVA were pretty uh, intrigued about how to get to different bases. I mean, they were pretty good about it. They could uh, zap, they could come in, hit, get back out again. All right. Now, operating out of there, did you have about the same level of activity as before? Or think, did things get quieter? For me, uh, after... Ripcord, uh, I lost some more team members up uh, doing some recon and work off another fire base. Uh, some good friends of mine uh, weren't killed, thank goodness. In fact, he's still kicking today. But he got it bad. In fact, less than a month ago, this guy uh, emailed me and they took a, wet, a bullet out of his arm. Been there since 1970. But he was blown up. And we, we got hit bad. We got blown up. Uh, RPGs. And a mortar, and uh, Sanford got got it. And I got to visit him in the hospital, which was nice. Then he got uh, back to the United States. But yeah, it was just about a month ago they realized he had a bullet in his arm. Mm -hmm. Kind of crazy. You think he would have set off some airport metal detectors? By you would have thought so. I don't think Sanford travels very far. He uh, likes to stay home. Okay, uh, so while you were in Vietnam. Uh, did you get an actual R&R, or did you just stay in contact? I, I, uh, I got to go to, my first R&R &R was called Eagle Beach. Our team was on a mission. We went right from the mission. We were beat, tired, sweaty, stinky, uh, fully armed, went to Eagle Beach, and we were given bathing suits, basically, and we were, I can't really, they were white shorts. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to be there for two or three days. Uh, I, we all got tanked up. We had fun. Oh, uh, they had, uh, you know, swimming activity, mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, uh, the line company got hit bad up in the Ashaw, and we were told that we had to sober up. Mm -hmm. They had choppers coming to Eagle Beach. They'd pick us up yeah, it was good at night, and we had to go in. And that was the last time I saw Eagle Beach. Mm -hmm. But I did go to R&R. Uh, &R. I finally got to go to, uh, they gave me a choice of Hawaii or... Uh, Thailand or Australia and I didn't want to go to Thailand and I didn't want to go to Hawaii because I figured if I went to Hawaii that's civilians and mm -hmm. uh, Americans yeah didn't want to so I went to Australia for a week okay what was that like uh, Sydney Australia was back then was just fantastic spent money got drunk uh, they had a lot of discos uh, the whole place was like discos it seemed like mm -hmm. uh, tried to unwind it was uh, Interesting because I was at uh, a, it was a, like a disco in uh, Australia, Sydney, and there's a gentleman that I grew up with from I born two blocks from this guy. He was in the Air Force. He was in he was pulling guard duty at Cameron Bay, and I never saw him when I was in the hospital. I went to Australia, and I was at this disco, and this guy comes up to me and he says, "Are you John Lund?" And I go, oh my God, it's Fish. I knew him as Fish, Randy Harris, Air Force. And he was in Australia the same time I was. So we got to hang around mm -hmm. a couple of days together. But he had his friends, I had mine. So we split. But I'm and unbelievable how small the world is. What was it like to have to go back to Vietnam after that? Uh, not very good, really. I mean, it was, I was getting sh shorter, although I never did want to say the word short because mm -hmm. I was, back then it was, I didn't want to say it, put it this way. Uh, then they put me uh, at Fubai, and our teams were at Fubai, and then I got to where they wouldn't let me out for some reason or another. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get rid of my weapon. I did not want to. Uh, they gave me a hooch finally to stay in at Fubai, and I would not relieve my weapon. I took my weapon everywhere I went, so they probably thought I had a little bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me back out anymore, and I was disappointed because I felt insecure at the fire at a big base. It was huge. Uh, I didn't feel that it was strategically supportive with people that I'd like to have around me. Mm -hmm. I was used to recon. Guys were good. Guys knew what they were doing. So uh, I spent the rest of my time uh, at Fubai. 
Did you have any actual duties, or were you just kind of there? No, I had duties. I worked for a, a real nice gentleman at a, a supply base. So I, I got to give out supplies and things mm -hmm. like that. How long were you there? Probably, if I remember right, something like two or and a half months. Okay, so quite a while. Yeah, I got to fatten up a bit, mm -hmm. and then uh, they sent me home. Okay. Now, uh, there are a lot of stories about sort of morale and related issues mm -hmm. and, and distinctions drawn between what was going on in the bases and out in the field. They mm -hmm. talk about drugs, they talk about race, they talk about discipline and that yeah. kind of stuff. Did you see a difference in any of those areas? I, I saw a difference. That's what I didn't like, the FUBAI. I didn't care for that. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is I don't care if you're North Vietnamese, what nationality or religion you are. When you get wounded or you die, you still got red blood. That's the mm -hmm. bottom line of it. And we had, our teams are really tight. They are still tight today, although we're old farts. Mm -hmm. And when we get together, we don't talk about war stories or nothing. We still don't. And, uh, but it's just the camaraderie. And when I got stuck at Fubai, there wasn't really the camaraderie. Some of the guys were uh, great, but there was some, you start looking at the whites and the blacks, and the blacks had their own groups, the whites mm -hmm. had their own groups. I didn't want any part of it. And then there was dope. That's what people used to say. Boy, well, used to must have get smoked up in mm -hmm. Vietnam. I never smoked pot. I mean, you could probably buy a suitcase for five bucks back in those days. Never once did I smoke pot. We'd get tanked up on warm beer, and that was about the extent of it. Mm -hmm. um, were there real discipline problems and fights or things like that that would happen, or was it really there was some fight? fighting? At, uh, I remember at Fubai uh, between black people and white people, and to this day I couldn't understand why. I mean, we had a, we had a, a mission to do back then. Uh, I just couldn't understand it. Okay. Now, another thing that was happening around this time and showing up on some of the bases was that there was a lot of heroin coming in. You did marijuana for a long time, but in some places that showed up, and yeah. it may have been a year or so later that it got yeah, really I bad. I never was familiar with that at all. The guys were smoking pot, yeah, things like that. But uh, yeah, so that that hadn't hit. Yeah. I was that, glad to get out of Fubai and. Mm -hmm and uh, fly down to Cameron Bay and finally get out. And then we, I didn't yell short though until I was probably 12 or 13 clicks in the air. I mean, then the whole jet just went wild. And I remember that to this day it was Tiger Airlines and the stewardesses were, I swear to gosh, they were my mother's age. Mm -hmm. And it was, just a, it was just a wild thing to get airborne to get out of there. It was just All wild. Right. And then where did you land in the States? I flew into Seattle, Washington, and it was not a good homecoming. Uh, they had picketing going on, they were throwing things at us, and you, and you had no idea that was happening. And, and I, I just, I was disappointed. I'm glad they probably didn't give us weapons when we got off the plane. I mean, we, we had our military clothes on from Vietnam, and I mean, you were sweaty, hot, some of us were, didn't have real clean clothes. And then they gave us a, like a, a deer rolls. They marched us in mm -hmm. through picketing and Constantino wire, and we got to change our clothes, put a new uniform on, and basically they said, here, you've got 30 days, 45 days, you guys go home, here's the pass, and you're on your own. Now, was your enlistment basically up, or did you have to no. do additional service in the States? I had service in the States. I had an extended leave, 45 days. Uh, in January, I drove from Cadillac, Michigan, through the mountains, out to Fort Ord, California, by myself. Winter was great, like 30 mm -hmm. below zero. And then I stayed at Fort Ord. For a short time, I did not adapt well to the spit and polish. Mm -hmm. And so they transferred me out of there, and I was a sergeant. I was a sergeant in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They transferred me out of there to a place called Hunter Leggett, which was south of uh, Fort Ord, which was California wise, it's mountainous and dead. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's a SEAL base, pretty much. And uh, I got to work with some civilians and some weaponry, and he, it was a good place for me to be, mm -hmm. away from the spit and polish. All right. So I mean, what was actually going on there? What was uh, A lot of civilians. Okay. Uh, they lived there at uh, Hunter Leggett, and they were testing different types of laser weaponry, things okay. like that, okay. which to me that was fascinating. And they also did some uh, Navy training uh, there. For specific weaponry, they had a lot of different foreign weapons, mm -hmm. which I grew up hunting and fishing. So right. I did enjoy the different weapons. So it was for me, it was kind of nice. 
And how long did you stay there? I was there until April. I actually lived off the base. I lived in Salinas at that point in time. Uh, another gentleman and I, we got a place in Salinas, and so we didn't have to go to Fort Ord at all. Mm -hmm. And how did the civilian population treat the military personnel in that area? Uh, not that good. But the only thing is there was a, seemed to be a lot of retired people, mm -hmm. and a lot of them weren't probably well off. They were probably didn't adapt well to civilian life either, mm -hmm. and retired and stuff. But, I mean, they were pretty good. I mean, if you wore a uniform, probably not that great. If you were in civilian clothing, the New Year in military, mm -hmm. military, because you had short haircut, yeah. and our mannerisms back then were a little bit different than civilian. Okay. But they now, were pretty good. To think back to the time in Vietnam, are there other things that kind of stand out in your memory that you haven't brought into the story yet? Uh, basically, the camaraderie of our four teams. I mean, we were like glue. If somebody was wounded, somebody was hurt, we were there. I mean, it was, well, we were there for line companies. Line companies were for us uh, also, but some of the crazy missions we went on. I mean, we went on missions of, uh, they do aerial and say we spotted, like, we put like an antenna out of the ground. So we'd put a, two teams in and sometimes it was pleasant, other times it wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were times that we, uh, had a helicopter shot down right on top of us. They were trying to get us more ammunition. And the guys stayed with us for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. They survived it. I think they didn't like to be with us as much as we didn't like them with us. <laughs> I mean, they're scared to death. Right. Yeah. Do you know, would you know where you were physically? Like if you ever crossed the border into Laos or anything like that? If somebody would tell us, like our lieutenant, that we just crossed the river into Laos, yes. Mm -hmm. But we did, we had maps, but the mm -hmm. maps didn't really come out and say, it'd say Laos mm -hmm. and Vietnam, but we really didn't care anyway. I mean, it's, and uh, we did have a motto, I hate to say it, but never die alone. We, that was one of our mottos. And we had mm -hmm. a, our teams, we had the same call sign all the time I was there, we were Scorpion, and we were supposed to change it, we didn't. Mm -hmm. But we liked the name Scorpion for our call sign. We were a bunch of young guys, good teams, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, good training even over there. The, some of the guys, our lieutenants, were all Rangers. Some of the sergeants were Rangers. So they had a lot more training than we did with mm -hmm. on recon. So they kind of give us guidance. Our, our survivability was probably, I'd hate to say it, it was very, very low survivability. If you could survive the first month, mm -hmm. It, you were an old timer in recon. All right. Uh, can I switch? Okay, so you had. Uh, now, what sort of issues did you have, or did you have anyone, in terms of just adjusting to civilian life again? You get I, back. I, oh, my parents didn't know what to do with me when they came home. Uh, I wouldn't sleep in bed. I had awful, awful nightmares. Uh, they were going to get me to a shrink in Cadillac. There wasn't, back then, there wasn't really shrinks. Mm -hmm. Uh, they took me downtown. I wouldn't leave the house the first week I was home. Then they uh, took me downtown. It was raining. Uh, I remember being on Main Street with my parents, and a car backfired, and I hit. The, I went down, mm -hmm. laying in the gutter. They took me back home, and there I was for another couple of days again, trying again, mm -hmm. trying to acclimate me. But when I first came home, I didn't want to be around people that much. Uh, people weren't too fond of anybody from Vietnam didn't care to be around people. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very fortunate to work in the trees up here in northern Michigan when I first came home. Mm -hmm. A gentleman I worked for when I was 16 and 17 uh, gave me a job working in the trees. So I was by myself, eight hours a day, mm -hmm. five days a week. So probably a good thing. All right. Uh, now, uh, did you eventually uh, go to college? I was very, yep, I uh, used the GI Bill. I graduated from Northwestern Traverse City. Uh, I wanted to get into either conservation or parks management. That's what I went through my curriculum. At the time, there wasn't much going there. So I ended up uh, doing about the same thing my father did, working in the automotive world. Cadillac mm -hmm. had some really nice uh, supply, uh, rubber-based companies mm -hmm. for suppliers of the automotive. I got in uh, bottom line, got my foot in the door, worked production, worked my way up. Uh, Today, it would be hard to do that with a basically a three-year college. I went back to college in 1980, the same place again, to use my GI Bill. Went into applied science for aviation. 
and uh, my father and I, because he was World War II aerial engineer, he always wanted to build an airplane. Mm -hmm. So in 1980, I went back to college, got my license, another year of welding, uh, blueprinting. Uh, he and I built an aircraft from scratch, took us five years, got to fly it for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, if it wasn't probably for college, back then though, a two-year degree would get you a long ways. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with a three-year degree. And in companies, it wasn't, you, you didn't have to have a master's degree per se to go somewhere. Right. As long as you had the ability, uh, knowledge, uh, the ability to work with people, back then that was more so than a lot of other things, mm -hmm. you could advance. And I was very fortunate to be able to advance. So you were able to sort of transition from just being all by yourself in, in, in the trees to going to classes. It to took a while. A job. Uh, college took a while. Didn't live on base. Uh, took a while adapting. Even when I was first employed uh, in a rubber industry, there was a lot of large noises. Uh, some of the people used to make the noise intentionally to watch me hit the floor. Mm -hmm. If your mind wasn't set up what you're doing, or you had the mindset had to be exactly what you're doing, you'd start daydreaming a bit and that wasn't good for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I think mentally I was able to take out, I don't like to dream anymore, I, I'm probably fortunate I don't, but uh, it was, uh, it took a long time. Even to this day there's things that trigger me mm -hmm. and uh, I stay away from that. Okay. And I'm sure there's an awful lot of people that went through the line companies uh, in Vietnam that are probably a lot worse off than I am. Okay. I'm very fortunate. Now, do you think that you took uh, anything positive out of your time in the service? Oh, yes. What would that be? Uh, camaraderie with people, uh, working with people, uh, the relationship of not just myself, but even, I hate to say it, but the Vietnamese people, different countries I was able to go to, like Australia, but uh, Vietnam, uh, the people that you got to work with, your Kit and Scouts, very honorable. Uh, to me, they were very honest mm -hmm. people, and even, I hate to say it, the North Vietnamese people had a mission. We had a mission, so mm -hmm. we did our mission. But to this day, if I were looking at trying to get a team together and I had a choice between some other nationalities or different countries, I'd have to say North Vietnamese people are very dedicated people. Mm -hmm. Korean rocks are very dedicated people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, with the, the Kit Carson Scouts, now one hears different things about them. Uh, the guys you had, were they clearly people who had been either North Vietnamese or long-term Viet Cong? Uh, North Vietnamese, regulars. Okay. Yep. And, and I don't know to this day if they've ever made it out. I hope they heck they did. But they were, they were good guys to work with, a uh, lot of fun. We had, we had fun swimming mm -hmm. down waterfalls up in the mountains, but they were very dedicated. They were good at knowing the signs better than us. Um, you think that because you were recon, they might have made a point of giving you the best ones, or? I really don't know, but we always seemed to get the best. At least I thought they were very good. And did you see much of, I guess when you were at Fubai, did they have civilians on base? Yes, they there? did. Mm -hmm. All right. What kind of impression did you have of the people who came in and worked on the bases? Uh, they seemed to be polite, uh, somewhat standoffish, but I guess I'd be the fight with them also. Mm -hmm. Uh, we actually got haircuts because there was actually a barber, there were Vietnamese barbers, and, you know, things like that. But I never, uh, I always had a job to do, we always had a job to do, I respected them for that. I got to where I hated losing my friends, I got to hate people. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the same with a lot of other people, whether they're line companies or got to hate people for losing your friends. Mm -hmm. But you didn't get the news and you didn't know what was going on in the States at all, really, back in right. those days. Okay. And did you go into civilian areas much at all, or no. just, just when you drove through them at some point? Uh, we drove through way once, and that was what I considered going mm -hmm. into a civilian area, driving through. And then they told us not to shoot any water buffaloes on the way through. Mm -hmm. That was the extent of our trip through. Now we, our teams stayed all the time on fire bases, and a lot of different fire bases, up to the LZ, in fact, all over the darn place. Mm -hmm. Whether they wanted us to do that because we were able to be fast and doing something else on different missions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, I think you've done a very efficient job of telling the story and telling us quite a bit. Uh, so. Second 501st uh, group, a uh, fantastic group. I, uh, the recon teams, I couldn't fast. I was very privileged to be with them. Mm -hmm.
All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to share the story today. Thank you.